Hey everyone, it's Natalie with Your Rad Life, and today I'll be meeting with Dr. Robert Bilder, Professor of Psychiatry and Psychology at UCLA Semmel Institute. He's also the director of UCLA's Brain Gym, so we'll be talking about how to exercise your hippocampus and whether or not those brain training programs really work. I um, wanted to ask you about the Brain Gym and what that is and what its function is here at UCLA. Sure, sure. Well, we um, started at UCLA a couple of years ago um, a healthy campus initiative, the idea being to make UCLA the healthiest campus in the United States. And so we've organized a number of different pods or program areas to try to cope with this. One of them is to eat well. That's okay. pretty self-explanatory. Another one is to move well. It focuses on physical activity and exercise. Uh, and then I'm uh, fortunate to be in charge of the Mind Well program, where we try to focus on things you can do for your mind, your brain, your spirit, and to promote your own creative achievement. So in the course of doing that, we've uh, embarked on a number of projects to try to alleviate stress, uh, to try to get people more engaged in their communities. Um, and we decided if we have a gym, uh, the Wooden Center, where people can go and work on their biceps, why not be able to come in and flex their brains and do brain training? So uh, we opened the Brain Fitness Center at UCLA, um, primarily to provide education to students, staff, and faculty, and now also open to the public uh, who may be interested in uh, working out their brain. Gym. The brain yeah. gym. So what we really try to understand is what people's overall um, uh, program of activities and their schedule of activities involves, okay. and to think about whether that involves good brain health or not. Um, because I think that uh, there are lots of um, uh, exercises that are available and that you can subscribe to online, uh, Lumosity being one of the best known examples. Right. Um, and uh, our opinion is that um, people really benefit from some guidance in how they may go about figuring out what to do. Um, because I don't think any of the programs so far offers a very clear, well-balanced program of brain engagement. Um, and uh, it's not often highlighted that there are certain risks to doing brain training. Um, one of the best studies that's been done so far looked at uh, uh, the effect of brain training in taxi drivers who are learning the uh, street maps. Okay. And it turned out that all that training that they got, several years of training, um, it led to an increase in the size of their hippocampus, a structure involved in memory in the brain, but it impaired their ability to do a simple visual memory task. So it's almost as if you could say that this part of their brain got too full. Um, and it, it highlights what um, I think is a, a more subtle message, which is that if you focus specifically on training a particular aspect of your cognitive function, it's going to probably focus on a particular aspect of your brain structure and function. And that can be too much. It would be like going to the gym and working out only your right bicep. And so you could end up with a large, bulging right bicep, but it would lead you to be imbalanced. One of my jobs is to be the director of the Tenenbaum Center for the Biology of Creativity. Okay. And in that project, um, we've um, had the opportunity to study a lot of people, um, what I call free-range humans, who are not selected for creativity. But then um, we be, uh, became very interested, well, what about the people who are really internationally known for particular kinds of, of creative endeavors? You know, what about the Picassos and the Mozarts of the world? Are these people really different? They're called big C creatives. Okay. Everyday creativity is sometimes referred to as little c creativity, but uh, extraordinary uh, world transforming talent is, uh, is known as big C creativity. Okay. So we have a project funded by the John Templeton Foundation to look at the brains and the behavior of big C creatives. Uh, and so we've been um, in that project looking at the brains and trying to see exactly are their brains developed differently or might they have uh, predispositions uh, that, that line up with special talents and abilities. Well, and and no one knows the answer to these questions yet. We have anecdotes. Like uh, uh, last week we had um, a little write-up in Entertainment Weekly okay. about a study we did of Gina Davis' brain. Okay. It turns out Gina uh, happened to be on the TV show Grey's Anatomy, okay. and so she was playing a doctor there who had some, um, you know, unfortunate personality characteristics. And they were trying to explain this in the plot line. It turns out she had a brain tumor, uh, they, so they, they wanted to make up a brain tumor. So they were planning, how do you get a brain tumor in Gina Davis? And Gina says, "Oh, I just had a brain. So I just had an MRI over at UCLA." And so we were able to supply the show 
with the images of her real brain and her real head. Um, so you can see them in Entertainment Weekly. Um, and, but just looking at Gina's brain, there were some you know, interesting features of it. And just the overall size and, and shape and configuration of her brain structure uh, you know, had interesting features, which you know, we can't interpret scientifically at this right. point. Um, but, uh, but it's intriguing to think about, well, what might be at the root of um, these uh, individuals' incredible talents? I mean, Gina, for example, is not only an Academy Award-winning actor, right. but also an Olympic-level archer. Oh, and okay. what few people know is an unbelievably uh, uh, skilled pumpkin carver. Um, at Halloween, uh, she has produced some spectacular jack-o'-lanterns inside other jack-o'-lanterns. This is so Can interesting. Can you imagine no, carving a pumpkin <laughs> inside another pumpkin? It's very it's interesting. Yeah. Is there a parallel between people kind of doing this sort of brain training or or uh, focused engagement and uh, puzzles and s somebody else practicing a craft like you know the piano or guitar or uh, a language even is there are there similar effects in the long run or even short term are you seeing or well the quick answer is nobody knows okay. um, because there hasn't been enough study um, what does seem to be the case is almost anything that you train your brain on you train um, that specific skill that specific skill will improve, and the brain structures associated with uh, performance in that particular skill area will be changed. Not just the function of the structure, but the structure itself will, will change. And what that means is that the activity within the circuitry is gonna cause the genes within the cells to be changed in the way that they express proteins, and it's gonna change the structure of the cells and the way the cells communicate with each other. So there are genuine changes taking place as a result of these exercises. The question is then, how does that generalize to any other broader activity? Right. So there's been a, a number of, of studies already that have shown that training in certain specific cognitive skills usually does not generalize to other cognitive skills. So just by training in, say, working memory, it may not improve your intelligence. Um, training in specific areas may, in fact, impair the ability to perform other functions. Uh, people often have a need for one of two major kinds of brain activity. One kind is the ability to enhance their focal attention, right. and the other is the ability to relax and to broaden their attention. It turns out the broadening of attention is associated with relief from anxiety, um, but many of us have problems being able to focus our attention efficiently enough when we need to, especially in a world filled with all kinds of distractors. Right. So I think that these two modes of thinking um, may be trainable. And so we're very interested in seeing how can we identify um, people's strengths and weaknesses in these domains and enable people to learn skills to be able to effectively focus on command and to broaden their attention and relax their attention on command when they want to. Um, and it's interesting that these two practices map on to some of the um, ancient techniques that are common in the contemplative sciences or in meditation practices. Yeah. And it's so interesting, there's a, one of our colleagues um, who um, uh, works with us uh, is named Labsang Rapke. Okay. Uh, Labsang um, uh, was, before he became a psychologist and researcher and clinician, he was a, a monk, Buddhist monk. Um, in fact, he was the Dalai Lama's Ayurvedic physician. So he was the guy who took care of the Dalai Lama. Uh, and um, but Labsang is very interested in this um, duality in the control of attention and the focusing and broadening of attention. But what he's discovered by looking at the ancient Tibetan texts okay. about meditation is that in contrast to some of the modern practices of meditation, which really focus on open monitoring of attention, following, getting some focal uh, awareness, that in the ancient uh, practices, you had to maintain your focus while simultaneously broadening attention. So it wasn't that you learned to focus and then broaden, you had to do both simultaneously. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a quite uh, intricate skill uh, to be able to sustain your focus while broadening your attention. And I think this is the kind of thing that, um, you know, as we learn more about how uh, we regulate our own brains, that we may be able to learn practices um, using specialized meditation techniques or neurofeedback um, uh, to be able to promote these kinds of activities.